Sir Peter Bottomley. Madam Deputy Speaker, welcome. Uh, paragraph 19 of the National Audit Office report says the department has acknowledged that only in a minority of cases would it be financially justifiable for building owners to bring legal action to recover money. And I won't read the rest of the paragraph, there isn't time. But that's the building owners. The building owners will only make a claim if they're indemnified by the residential leaseholders who haven't got the money. So it's not going to happen. And if you look at the sums that the departments reclaimed, very low. What's clearly obvious, and it follows, I think, from the report by Ted Bailiou, the former Premier of Victoria in Australia, an architect, in a report, his, his working party was set up two weeks after the Grenfell fire, reported within two years, he gave a presentation to the Fire Safety All Party Group and the uh, Leasehold and Commonhold Reform Group that you won't get money from leaseholders. You've got to get, find the problems, fix the problems, fund the problems, and then see how you get the money back. We know that the Ministry of Housing have got just over five billion from the Treasury. They expect to get perhaps two billion back in tax, two billion back in levy. We know that if there's 15 billion spent, there'll be three billion back in VAT. So the Treasury seems to make money out of this. And who's left with the 10 billion left to spend, to fund the residential leaseholds who can't afford it? It's quite clear that the government have got to do two things. One, as I said to the Secretary of State during his speech, extend the Building Act so that people can make a claim within six years of knowing there's a problem. And secondly, make sure that the insurance industry know that they are ultimately reliable for what the architects have done, the designers have done, the component suppliers have done, the builders have done, the regulators have done, the building control people have done, and get most of the money back by agreement. No point in having individual leaseholders or groups of them taking legal action. It won't work. So I'll say to the Secretary of State, in this case, please listen to those who know and try to make sure that no examination takes place without leaseholders being part of the committee. They could have told the Secretary of State four years ago that his approach wasn't working. We're grateful for some progress. We need much more. Patricia Gibson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I want to, I want to come to the, to the Minister's uh, written statement, the, which was delivered with breathtaking speed. Um, and before I do that, I want to remind the House uh, that my husband owns a property which may be affected by the cladding issue. And I want to focus much of my remarks on part five of this bill, which includes provision to establish a new housing ombudsman scheme, um, with parts one to four of the bill focusing on matters, matters applicable to England and Wales only. The issue is that whilst housing is not a devolved responsibility, Housing is a devolved responsibility, consumer affairs are not, and that creates challenges for the creation of the Housing Ombudsman Scheme. But of course there are benefits to delivering that scheme on a UK-wide basis, because we know that there are concerns about 90% of new homes having defects, and a quarter of those who move into new homes are unhappy with aspects of their new properties. And the existing New Home Standards Code is industry-led and voluntary, and it's welcome that this will now be replaced with a mandatory and statutory code to ensure similar standards to which developers are obliged, obligated to meet, backed up by an ombudsman which we would hope would have teeth with powers to require builders to resolve issues or face fines and giving this code a new authority and credibility. But I say to the Minister, it's very important that this system is established on a UK-wide basis and that, because builders operate across the UK. So it makes sense to have a single body of rules and standards to ensure improvement across the board. But because that uniformity across the board will benefit consumers across the UK, it is very important that the governments at the table from across the UK in all parts of the UK have their voices heard. Because we all want to see a raising of standards in the building of new homes. So it's a, an eminently sensible way forward. And we would expect that legislative, legislative consent would be requested from the Scottish Government. And that consent, of course, would be granted if it were in the interests of the people of Scotland. And, of course, the, 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 the consent 
and the dialogue with the Scottish Government cannot be a box-ticking exercise. It must be genuine. Now, what I would say, Madam Deputy Speaker, is I want to say a few words about the breathtakingly quick statement that was delivered today, because the Secretary of State said when he delivered this statement that risk for, for new build properties, risk, sorry, for, for the, the, the cladding properties, should be man the risk should be focused on management and mitigation instead of costly remediation work. And we don't know what he means by the word costly, because some properties below 18 metres faced costs for stripping cladding, which are actually more expensive than the properties themselves. And we're told in this statement that costly remediation work can be challenged. There's no detail as to how it can be challenged, and the, the, the content is actually quite vague. We're told that lenders have welcomed this advice. We don't know how quickly those affected by the cladding issues will see change from lenders and insurers. Has the, has the Secretary of State had specific talks with the insurance industry? Has he had discussions with the Association of British Insurers? We simply don't know. This statement doesn't tell us. He himself has said in the past, in February of this year, I think it was, that insurers should be price, pricing risk correctly and not passing on costs or profiteering. And yet, I'm, I'm not clear, having read that statement, if he has had any, any dialogue with in, insurers before this statement. Uh, we still see that in this statement that there will be repayment costs not exceeding £50 per month, so we still don't have a cap. We still don't know what the final bill will, will be for those affected. Now, I wonder if the Secretary of State has actually been looking or taking an interest in what's happening in Scotland, because what's happening in Scotland is that the Scottish Government have moved towards a single buildings assessment for the properties that may be affected by this cladding issue. And what that has meant is that there will be a, an assessment of the buildings which will be, provide clear evidence of what the total need for remediation will be. And this allows the Scottish Government to identify the buildings that are at risk and therefore informs the owners of these buildings exactly what measures need to be taken. And it could release people from safety and mortgage lending concerns. It may save homeowners in the end hundreds of thousands of pounds that they may otherwise have had to pay for, external, for individual external wall fire review forms. So the cost of the single building assessments is to be met by the Scottish Government and once it's been established, remediation will be targeted to the buildings most at risk. So that's an important innovation and I see echoes of that in what the Minister said, Secretary of State said today but it's too vague for me to actually be sure. But it's interesting, Madam Deputy Speaker, that the statement today has a focus on buildings below 18 metres. And when we had a debate on this very issue at the end of June, I challenged the, the Secretary of State because the Sunday Times reported that a key civil servant was recorded telling fire engineers that 18 metres was the cut-off point in the first place because the government, and I quote, haven't got time to come up with a better number. So I wonder if that randomness of the 18 metres is behind much of what we've heard today. But of course, nobody in the House except the Secretary of State has a time to properly digest it. So, the new housing ombudsman in this bill is welcome, provided it's implemented in a way that is respectful of devolution and in the future prevents some of the shocking problems we've seen in the cladding scandal, which has turned so many lives upside down. And it's important that, the, that we understand that the powers of the, um, the housing ombudsman are not retrospective. Therefore, it offers very cold comfort for those living through the, the, the cladding and fire safety nightmare right now. And I fear that the Minister's statement today has done nothing to tr properly address that. So for all those reasons, it's clear that more needs to be done to address the current safety scandal, which I know that this bill doesn't do. The current safety scandal blights lives and continues to blight lives for those living in flats that they have told are dangerous. But for today, we're told, well, do you know what? That might not really be the case. We'll need to think about it a wee bit more and talk to the banks. That's not good enough. Mm -hmm. So 
People are living in flats that cause them concern. We still don't have any answers on insurance and we still don't have any proper insight into how this will be resolved fully because the £5.1 billion that the Secretary of State likes to trumpet doesn't even touch the sides, Madam Deputy Speaker. Doesn't even touch the sides. And whatever else is offered in this fire and safety bill, it offers nothing to the people currently living in homes that are making them lose sleep and which they cannot sell. Media to Stephen McPartland. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Once again, I'm here to ask the Minister to provide support to protect leaseholders from the devastating mental and financial costs of historic fire safety defects. Leaseholders are drowning under mountains of debt in properties they cannot sell, they cannot remortgage and are going bankrupt right now. Devastating interim costs are mounting up. Insurance premiums up thousands of percent, waking watches that are not even regulated by the local fire service, and we're four years on from the tragic events in Grenfell. Leaseholders have done nothing wrong, but in January 2020, the minister created a market failure, and we have a responsibility to clean it up. I believe the written ministerial statement the Secretary of State has laid today could reverse some of the damage he did, but it will need to be put into legislation, as speakers have already suggested, to provide real practical support to leaseholders not just rhetoric. This could be a huge victory for leaseholders in buildings under 18 metres today, but only if it means the Secretary of State is withdrawing the January 2020 consolidated advice notes for building owners of multi-storey, multi-occupied residential buildings. Otherwise, it's just weasel words. I want to believe the Secretary of State, and I hope the ministerial statement has just reactivated the values of hundreds of thousands of properties that had no value earlier today. However, leaseholders need to know today does this mean buildings under 18 metres are no longer required to undertake expensive remediation costs? What about those buildings that have already had EWS1 and are currently facing huge bills? The Building Safety Bill runs to over 200 pages, but only one clause totaling two pages deals with remediation costs for leaseholders. That single clause, Clause 124, 124, is so weak, it's pretty much pointless and could be considered to be complied with by having sent an email. We cannot continue to abandon leaseholders. We have to support them. And the Building Safety Bill in its current form does not do that. So I'll be seeking to amend it with my colleagues. And I repeat once again my desire for the government to work with me and colleagues to help get this right. I would like nothing more than to see government amendments to protect leaseholders at report stage, which I can support and bang the drum for. I do not want taxpayers to pick up the bill. Leaseholders do not want taxpayers to pay. Responsible freeholders do not want taxpayers to pay. We want all, all want those who are responsible to pay. So I'll table amendments to help leaseholders. And they will be trying to adapt the Housing Defects Act 1984, so it applies to cladding and fire safety defects. We'll be trying that will empower government and local authorities to help leaseholders and then provide the funds. Clause 57 already sets out a mechanism for collecting levies. So we could try to amend that so the government can set out a separate levy on new house building with the money to be redirected to fire safety defects remediation for existing buildings. I'll table amendments to um, try and ensure that recovery of VAT on remedial works, it's VAT free, and the government has to create an indemnity scheme like Flood Ray or the Motor Insurance Bureau. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Welcome to the, the Chair. It's good to see you there. Um, the, the Select Committee did pre-let scrutiny on the bill. I think uh, what has been shown there is that is, this is how the House should operate. It's a very technical bill, uh, and we went through it line by line, made recommendations. Thank the government, and particularly the Building Safety Minister, for taking it seriously, to responding to all our points in great detail, and to talking to us about it. Uh, the committee still got some concerns, and we've just written again to the minister the other day uh, about the things that we think are missing. One, of course, is the issue of building control. Developers should not be able to appoint their own building control inspectors. There's a conflict of interest there. Uh, in terms of risk, it is not just height alone which makes buildings risky. A care home of one storey high is potentially risky, and that needs to be taken into account in the role of the building safety regulator. In terms of qualification and training of everyone working on high-rise buildings, the government are going to come forward with some proposals, but it's really important because currently an electrician rewiring a flat in a high-rise development does not have to be qualified. 
They have to be, they, their, their employer has to be part of a competent person scheme, but the individual does not have to be qualified anywhere in the building industry. Those sorts of matters need addressing now in this piece of legislation. Product, uh, uh, wait, 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 wait. I thank my friend for giving way and, all, and for all the work on his committee. He's raised a very important point there about building control and uh, the independence of building control. Would he agree with me that this is uh, an issue that is causing considerable uh, lack of confidence in people, uh, for people who have bought properties who are then finding they've got no recourse and also a, a real question about the role of local authorities in building control? I think there, there are major issues here about the independence of building control, not just on the highest rise building, but right throughout the building industry, and that's what the Select Committee report uh, drew attention to. Uh, product testing. We await the government's proposals because one of the things that Hackett identified was, was the product testing regime is broken uh, and needs fixing. Uh, and the committee stand by its view that if a product comes commercially to the market and has gone to testing and has failed a test, that information should be made available publicly. It's important information. The government have rejected that, but I hope the government might just give further consideration to that in due course. And I'll just come to the statement today. I mean, it is very difficult to make uh, co comprehensive sense of this statement. I'm going to say I hope the Secretary of State will accept an invitation to come to the Select Committee uh, after the summer recess uh, and discuss this matter with us in more detail. But, but whatever this, uh, this paper says, this statement, it still leaves out buildings over 18 metres which have defects that are not just about cladding. There are people facing bills of £50,000 even when cladding defects have been put right that they can't afford. Where is the help for those leaseholders? It isn't in anywhere in the legislation. And coming on to, to buildings below 18 metres, between 11 and 18 metres, I don't understand. It's, the Secretary of State said that there weren't systemic defects found in those buildings. Where does cladding fit into that? Is the government now saying that the removal of combustible cladding from buildings between 11 and 18 metres is no longer going to be required? If it is, who is going to pay for it? The government floated the idea of a loan scheme. There's no reference to a loan scheme in the legislation. Has the loan scheme been ditched? I think we need to clarification on these important issues because leaseholders need certainty uh, that they aren't going to have to face these bills. Madam Deputy Speaker, there are important issues in this bill. It's generally to be welcomed. There are still issues that we want to, the government to go further on. But the explanation of this statement and who is going to pay for some of the costs which the Building Safety Fund does not cover is still of an essential matter that the government needs to think again about. Yeah. Yeah. Sir Mike Penny. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and welcome to the Chair. And perhaps I should declare an interest as a former firefighter myself and the former fire minister. For me, I took the promise from the Housing Minister, who is a good friend of mine, an honourable gentleman, that the previous bill, the Fire Bill, was not the vehicle to bring forward and protect the leaseholders in my constituency. And I did table, or sign some amendments as probate amendments, but I then withdrew. And I took a lot of flack in my constituency from leaseholders that said I'd let them down. I'm not going to let them down with this bill, because this bill was supposed to actually address the, the concerns that they had. Thousands of my leaseholders are trapped within their properties. Thousands of them have already paid unbelievable amounts of money, which they can't afford. And even if they can, could afford, it's morally wrong in the first place. Well, my honourable friend is right. Of course. Um, while I understand that the ministerial statement was late in being shown to us, would he agree with me that there's much in that to be optimistic about? I agree with my honourable friend, and there was a lot in it that's good. If I'd have had a chance to read it while the Secretary of State was actually still making his speech, because I'm not that brilliant at doing these things, but I've read it since the Secretary of State sat down, and there are some good things in there. There are questions about it, which, which I hope, and I hope the Treasury Advance are listening to me, I hope to be on the committee when this goes to the committee stage, I suggest that might be slightly difficult for the, for the ministers. Um, but for me, there are I completely agree with my honourable friend from Stevens. I agree with the chairman of the select committee. I agree with much from the, the opposition front bench as well. This should not be party politics. This should be what's right and what's wrong. This is a home-owning nation, and that includes freeholders and leaseholders. This party that I'm proud to be part of is a home-owning party. And Grenfell and I pay huge respect to the families that have lost their loved ones and that were injured, and my former colleagues that went in the right direction with their paramedic friends and the police when the rest of the public quite rightly got out of the way. The bravery of the firefighters at that incident is to be commended. 
But there are other issues that are not in this bill. It's not all about cladding, Madam Deputy Speaker. This is about the remedial works that they're being charged for. It's about the fire watch. I mean, I've actually heard of situations where, in one block, a low, fairly low-rise block actually, where they were told they couldn't have any mats outside their doormats, outside their front door. As a former firefighter, I look at that and I think that's bonkers. They were told to take pictures of the wall in the communal areas. That's not what went wrong at Grenfell. What went wrong at Grenfell was a systematic failure across the picture, including within the fire service, to be fair, who were, I was trained on high rise, and we told residents at high rise to stay in their, in their flats. We told them they were safe in the stairwell. Often they wouldn't be. But one area which fascinates me, Madam Speaker, we, we've referred about insurance here. We keep talking about premiums on insurance. Where are the insurance companies paying out? That were premiums that were paid by the developers and contractors. Because I couldn't walk on when I was a builder, I couldn't walk onto a building site without having liability insurance. We can do this. We did this as a government when the Mesa Lima Foma, Mesa Viva Loma bill went through this house, where we compensated people that were dying from asbestos, where they couldn't find the insurer and they couldn't find the contract. And the government intervened. The government intervened to compensate those families and those loved ones. That's what we'll have to do on this. And I will be joining my colleagues on amendments that we signed. If I can't get on the committee, committee stage, what a great opportunity at report stage. Not because I want to be difficult. I want to get this right for leaseholders. I was promised the previous bill wasn't the answer. This has to be the answer to put things right. Matthew Pennycook. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I very much welcome the fact that this House is acting to address the systemic problems identified in the Hackett Review. I also welcome a number of specific measures in the bill, for example, the new standards proposed for product safety and for professionals involved in the design and construction of buildings. What I cannot welcome, and what I find particularly objectionable, given what so many have faced over recent years, is the financial cost this bill will impose on leaseholders if left unamended. That imposition will be felt in part as a result of provisions set out on the face of the bill, whether it's the direct cost of the proposed building safety charge or the costs of duties imposed on principal accountable persons that will inevitably be passed on, this bill will see leaseholders pay out billions of pounds over the coming years to finance the new regime it establishes. Imposing charges of that magnitude on already hard-pressed leaseholders cannot be right, and the bill, in my view, needs to be amended to ensure a more equitable apportionment of the costs of the new regime. But this bill will also impose costs on leaseholders as a result of what it doesn't contain. In his opening remarks, the Secretary of State cited the extension of the Defective Premises Act, the limitation period changes, and the provisions in the bill that require landlords to take reasonable steps to recover remediation costs. But he knows as well as I do that these measures will only offer limited protection at best. What this bill singularly fails to do, despite, as others have said, the perfectly clear indications given by ministers during the passage of the Fire Safety Bill, that this was the legislative vehicle by which to do it, is to meaningfully protect all affected leaseholders from the costs of remediating historic cladding and non-cladding defects and associated secondary costs irrespective of circumstance. And it must be overhauled so that it does. Because if not now, then when do we act to protect all those caught up in this crisis? If not by this piece of legislation, then what other? Madam Deputy Speaker, I have no intention of voting against the principle of the bill today. We need a version of it on the statute book as soon as possible. But I say to the Secretary of State very plainly that without amendments to guarantee all leaseholders are fully protected, he will not get this bill through without a fight. The very fact that we are legislating for a radical overhaul of building regulations and fire safety highlights just how flawed the present regime is. We cannot, surely, in good conscience, ask any blameless leaseholder to pay to make good what is, after all, a failure of government-designed regulation and of industry practice. So I urge the government to work with members from across the House to ensure that, come third reading, this bill does right by each and every one of the victims of the building safety scandal. Yeah. Yeah. Royston Smith. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And for the avoidance of doubt, can I uh, refer myself or the House to my declaration in the uh, Register of Interest? I don't think this does affect me, but just in case and for avoidance of doubt. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, I really hope that we would have resolved the awful situation for leaseholders during the passage of the Fire Safety Bill. But of course, we'll know that didn't happen. 
During those many debates, the Government told us that the Parkland Smith amendments to the Fire Safety Bill were defective and the Fire Safety Bill was not the place to deal with who pays for remediation. The Government said the Building Safety Bill was the bill to address those issues. We now know that the Building Safety Bill in its current form does nothing to address the fundamental issue. Leaseholders should not and will not have to pay. Too many issues have been deemed fire safety defects when they are not, and the Minister and his statement have referred to it. But it cannot be repeated often enough. Most people in high and low-rise apartments are safe. Most buildings are not dangerous. Not all cladding is flammable. And I'm not sure, Madam Deputy Speaker, what you would have to do to ignite a wooden balcony, for example. But people living in properties with those features cannot sell and have extortionate insurance bills. Some simple changes, such as smoke alarms and fire alarms, and a realistic re-inspection would make those properties uh, currently dangerous safe again. And I hope that the written statement again becomes legislation and will go some way to address it. If we look at the properties which should not be failing EWS1 and we remove them from the process, the remaining buildings could be remediated far more quickly. Most properties would then see their values restored and the market will once again operate successfully. Madam Deputy Speaker, there are of course other issues and in summing up, uh, I hope the Minister will explain why insurers have apparently been let off the hook. Every development has professional indemnity insurance. It's the law. As soon as there's a complaint, the insurance are, insurers are informed. As soon as they are informed, they should start the process of settling any claims. Why are they allowed to remain in the shadows while innocent leaseholders pick up the tab? Isn't it time for us to name and shame the insurers who covered the risk of development but have not offered to put right the defects. One solution, of course, is a levy and a levy that house builders now accept. They know, and I know, and everyone else knows, that it's the only way out. They want out of this nightmare as quickly as everyone else. They are suffering reputational damage for issues that were no more there for than leaseholders. It was down to regulation and, 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 and legislation, and the failure of the insurance companies have some way to go in that. Madam Deputy Speaker, taxpayers should not pick up the tab, but they can underwrite the remediation not covered by insurance. The levy can then pay back the underwriting, and everyone can go back to living in a safe property, which is what they deserve to do. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, as others have said, this bill uh, represents progress in terms of implementing, taking forward the recommendations of the Hackett Review, but it will not come into effect until what will be a full five years after the Grenfell tragedy. And in those five years, hundreds of thousands of leaseholders have lived their lives under the fear of fire, under the threat of their own personal safety under the fear of uh, being trapped in unsellable and unmortgageable properties um, and of bearing costs that they are completely unable uh, to fund, in uh, a number of cases, costs that exceed the value of the property when they purchased it. Um, what we know, um, and we will obviously be digesting the contents of the statement as well, is that the bill itself will not do enough to overcome uh, the damage that has been done to leaseholders and to compensate them for the costs they have already borne and will continue to bear, and that further amendments will be absolutely essential um, before this bill uh, passes into uh, law. I was particularly struck in the ministerial uh, opening uh, statement um, that uh, we now are in a situation where uh, waking watch um, has been uh, dismissed uh, as, uh, uh, as in many cases a scam as being unnecessary um, and I do think it is uh, absolutely rich of the government uh, to be saying this when it has been the principal means of which it, uh, that, that has been relied upon uh, to ensure uh, uh, the safety uh, of those living in high-rise properties um, and uh, uh, I think that, that there will be people who have been paying for such waking watch um, over these uh, last years that will listen with amazement to what the government is now saying um, and uh, it's uh, a glib dismissal uh, of a, uh, a scheme uh, that it has itself been uh, rely, uh, relying on. Um, even five years on after Grenfell, there is still clear evidence that the necessary culture changes in the building industry have not taken place. As the London Fire Brigade says, there are still developers gaming the system, cutting corners, and there is clearly still not a level playing field which protects the interests of the only people, the tenants and the leaseholders, who are entirely blameless in this. 
I just want to make one uh, particular point, though, that I think possibly doesn't get covered enough in this. Although uh, uh, the uh, 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 fire safety and building safety problems have been a catastrophe in terms of their personal impact for leaseholders, there are also significant implications for the social housing sector. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, housing associations have faced remediation costs of £10 billion, um, and the consequences of that mean a dramatic fall in the house building programme um, and, indeed, in the investment that is necessary to deal with other uh, safety and repair uh, and maintenance issues uh, in that sector. Those tenants and those people in housing need should not be also victims of a crisis that they had no part uh, in, and the social housing sector must be fully compensated for its actual costs um, in, the, uh, uh, in the months and years to come. And by video link, Paul Maynard. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and very much welcome to the hot seat. Um, I wanted to highlight just one aspect of building safety that I don't believe has been covered either in the bill or in the debate so far today. Now, safety on stairs might seem to be rather a niche issue compared to many of the issues around fire safety that we are discussing, but it has to be more than just a case of, of what way you are going. As Rosper, the Royal Society for the Prevention of Accidents, has discovered, falling on the stairs is a significant cause of death stretching into the many hundreds a year. However, one hospital admission caused by a burn, there are 235 caused by falls. The impact of these falls is felt disproportionately by all the people. And even when a fall is not fatal, it is often the first stage of a persistent decline. Falls create fear. They impact on confidence and well-being and lead to people being moved out of their own homes and into care homes in many cases, never to return. Now, I represent a predominantly elderly constituency, and I'm in no doubt about the importance of stair safety to maintaining independence in the home for as long as possible. But I'm also someone with cerebral palsy. I know it isn't just the elderly, but people like me who also have to be exceedingly careful when navigating staircases. Now, there is an existing industry standard, which is standard 5395-1 regarding how stairs should be constructed, including rules on the dimensions of stairs and handrails. Stairs built to the British standard lead to 60% fewer falls. While this has been the standard since 2010, it has not, as of yet, been enshrined into law, and this is often not used by builders. I have written to the Building Safety Minister to ask for the Building Safety Bill to include a mandate for the British standard to apply in all new built homes. I plan to propose such an amendment myself, should he not give me sufficient satisfaction. It is worth noting that this is a cause by both private and social housing providers. It will create a level playing field in house building, but more importantly, will massively reduce the number of falls on stairs in the future easing the burden on a and &E and on ambulances, and saving many families from unnecessary and premature tragedy. Thank you very much. Meg Hillier. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and welcome uh, to your position. Madam Deputy Speaker, I need to declare an interest in that I am a leaseholder in an affected block, although happily uh, for myself and my neighbours, the developer that built the block is footing the bill for everything. Uh, as I have scaffolding around me and cladding being removed right now. Um, this bit is welcome, but it's taken a long time to get here. And of course, as others have said, it doesn't solve the problem completely. And in our, my brief remarks, I just want to um, acknowledge and reflect everything that my honourable friend, the member of Manchester Central, said at the dispatch box, um, because she had summed up the challenges completely and the fact that we don't want to, it's not about scoring cheap party political points at all. We need to get this resolved for all of our constituents up and down the country. And um, of course, we see though, legislation is one step along the way, four years on from the Grenfell disaster, but there's a long t gap, time lag between legislation and action. And if I take, there's just one recent example that the Public Accounts Committee, which I have the privilege of chairing, I looked at. We were recently examining the work of the Office for Product Safety and Standards that has only just assumed responsibility for product safety in this sphere, and it's not yet developed a methodology about how it will deliver that. I'm not no criticism of the OPSS, it, it's got a job to do, but it's only just taken that on. Um, and that's 2021, 20, four years uh, since the Grenfell disaster. So it's an example of how a small delay in government can mean a really long delay 
for those thousands of constituents of ours who are really suffering this. And, but the government delays also compounded the situation. We, we have seen from the beginning, a number of us have been talking about there being too few fire safety surveyors, there's been confusion over the EWS1 forms. I haven't got time to go into the written statement, but I concur with my honourable friend, the member for Sheffield, uh, who um, spoke about that. And the insurance and mortgage industries have added, adding to a cost and uncertainty by doing what they do, but government not recognising that some of the statements made by government caused those problems. And government should have been better at predicting those problems. The pots of money are welcome, but smaller than needed. And I, I think the father of the house summed it up, the member, honourable member for West Worthing, summed it up very well, that we need to get leaseholders off the hook, and then government needs to be very canny, and all of us will support government in trying to then secure the money from developers. And of course, we've also got to look at social housing, where today's leasehold victims, where support for them is at the cost of future housing for tenants and future leaseholders, at a time when housing supply is a Cinderella to the government's policy of fueling demand. The extraordinary written statement today came so late that I do hope that the Secretary of State will agree to appear in front of our sister committee, the Housing Communities and Local Government Committee, because I think there are really important questions, and I think we'll all be flooded with our inboxes over the next few days. But we still need skills to do this work, and I really urge the Minister, on top of this legislation, to look at delivering that. And we need to get clear clarity on the levy and on legal action, which is out of the price bracket of many, most of our constituents on top of the bills that they're already paying. Um, so we need this tackling. This bill is a start, but there are many people still living in limbo. And by video link, Dr Matthew Offord. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. There are measures included in this bill that are to be welcomed, but there is a great deal more required. I'm pleased that the government has listened to the Housing Communities and Local Government Select Committee, which recommended that the bill be amended to explicitly exclude historical costs from the building safety charge. However, it does not appear that the government believes the bill will completely protect leaseholders from remediation costs. The explanatory note states that the building safety bill does not make leaseholders liable for the cost of undertaking capital works, for example, removing unsafe cladding. However, where existing leases allow for these remediation costs to be passed on, the Builder Safety Bill will bring forward measures to protect leaseholders by placing additional duties on the building owner to explore alternative cost recovery routes before passing costs to leaseholders. Costs can still be passed on if building owners can show that all other avenues have been exhausted. Consequently, the bill is focused on constructing and maintaining new buildings rather than fixing safety issues in existing blocks. I welcome the government's decision to extend the limitation period of the Defective Premises Act of 1972 to protect future leaseholders, but it is not particularly viable for others given the inherent difficulties of taking legal action against well-funded developers, who would likely continue to argue that buildings met regulatory approval at the time of their construction. The government is fully aware that potential defendants in some cases no longer exist or are insolvent or the legal costs of taking action are likely to outweigh the costs for remediation works. This is in addition to the stress and time it would take for legal action to conclude. The bill contains no detail on the forced loan scheme for leaseholders in medium rise buildings and no help whatsoever for those in low rise buildings. I understood that details of the cladding tax loan scheme would be forthcoming in the March budget. However, now the guidance is that we will have to wait until September for an idea of how the scheme will work. Finally, there has been no real movement on the urgent and expensive issue of building insurance premiums and unaffordable costs people are being forced to pay right now for interim measures. However, the Minister will be pleased to learn that I will be voting for this bill today at the second reading, as it is the only lifeline available to my constituents who are facing financial despondency but I will be looking for amendments in committee and a report stage. Many people have bought these properties, whether their first property or indeed subsequent later properties, and have invested not only their life, but their, their savings and indeed their financial future upon the basis of bricks and mortar. We cannot allow these people to uh, seek demands against them that will fundamentally bankrupt many. It is a conservative principle that we encourage people to buy their own homes. Now these people need our help and support. We must not leave them failing. And by video link, Barry Gardner. I'm not sure what's worse for leaseholders. The fact that they're in constant fear because their homes are unsafe, 
the fact that they cannot afford to make them safe and are being harassed by greedy managing agents, or the fact that they're trapped in their flats without any easy option to sell and move on with their lives. Today's statement and this bill does not fundamentally change that for all the reasons the Father of the House set out in his brief but excellent speech. During the passage of the Fire Safety Bill, ministers promised these issues would be addressed in the Building Safety Bill. Lord Greenhalgh said, It is unacceptable for leaseholders to have to worry about costs of fixing historic safety defects in their building that they didn't cause. Building owners are responsible for ensuring the safety of residents. And he said they should protect leaseholders from the costs of remediating historic building defects. I don't know what the correct term in Parliament is for someone who makes promises they don't keep, but I know what they call them on the streets of Brent North. They call them a government minister. Extending the scope and duration of the Defective Premises Act in the Building Safety Bill shows the government doesn't understand the extent of the problem. I'd ask the minister to explain to my constituents who live in Wembley Central Development how it will help them. The original developer of their homes, St Modwins, have washed their hands of these defective properties. They sold them to an offshore company in Jersey in 2018, following the introduction of the new building regulations. They were in partnership with Sowcrest, who are now in a very convenient liquidation. So who exactly does the minister think my constituents can chase here? What is the government prepared to do about buildings with obscure corporate ownership? I first contacted Sim Modwins in 2017, immediately after the Grenfell tragedy. They repeatedly assured me the buildings were safe and in 2018 confirmed in writing that no fire safety defects had been identified. I'm now told the cladding on this building is the same as that used in Grenfell Tower and the fire safety report has identified fire stopping defects throughout the construction process. But in May of this year, St Modwin agreed to a takeover bid of $1.2 billion from Blackstone. Can the minister tell me how this bill will make them accountable for their actions? It wasn't the leaseholders who decided to use flammable cladding to leave out fire stopping in voids or cut corners. Developers made those decisions. My constituents don't have either the deep pockets or the legal expertise to fight these corporate chameleons who start off in London and end up in Jersey as a different company. And this bill shows the government either doesn't understand or doesn't care. The companies can afford lengthy litigation, leaseholders cannot. Finally, the minister must explain why there is so little progress on the building safety fund. I wrote to St Modwins on the 23rd of June. I still wait a response. I've written to Freedom, the new managing agent for the new owners. I asked them about their application to the building safety fund for the removal of unsafe cladding. I've received no response. But Freedom now tell residents they missed the closing date of 30th June for the second application because they are still waiting to have I eligibility confirmed for the first. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, and I, I welcome the Secretary of State's statement that the EWS-1 forms should not be required on buildings below 18 meters because lenders were insisting on EWS-1 forms despite not meeting proper criteria in the new guidance, so that is a welcome announcement. And the um, working toward the market correction for the total risk aversion that we were seeing in the market with lenders, um, surveyors, and just the sort of absolute stagnation in the market, so I welcome those uh, announcements in the written statement. However, I must echo the concerns raised by my honorable friend from Stevenage and the father of the house regarding leaseholders and, um, and the issue of clause, I think it's 124. Um, I would like to see much greater levels of, uh, of actual legislation to support leaseholders. And I'm speaking today not on just behalf of leaseholders, but the parents of leaseholders in my constituency. Parents in Beaconsfield, Marlowe, Flackwell Heath, Iva, who have given their life savings to help support their child buy their first home, usually in London. And these children um, of my constituents are now stuck in homes that they cannot afford to, to move out of because of the, the, the spiraling cost of both insurance and the cost to the leaseholder that has been incurred on them because of the building safety regulations. And I would ask that we would consider how to help leaseholders. These are these are conservative voters. These are the children of conservative voters who are now frustrated and angry that they cannot move up the housing ladder. We need to consider a way forward for them and remember that they have done what, what 
we as conservatives say that, that we always want to do, buy a home, allow people to get on the housing ladder, and we are blocking them from moving forward. So please, I would ask the Secretary of State to consider further action to how we can help and support leaseholders moving forward. Matt Rodder. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I'd like to welcome you to your place. Um, it's a pleasure to speak in this important debate and to follow colleagues from across the House. And I would like to uh, say that the bill is a step forward. However, I have very serious reservations, and I want to build on the points made by my honourable friend on the front bench, and also indeed by other, other colleagues across the House, including the father of the House and others. Um, first of all, I think it's very important to focus on the, most, the single most important point about this bill, the single most important weakness indeed, which is that many, many thousands of existing leaseholders are not going to benefit from this bill, and they are going to be penalised with huge, exorbitant costs, far above what they could possibly pay off um, due to the way that the government is tackling this deep crisis and the lack of funding, the insufficient funding to make good the very serious problems with leasehold properties around the country, which have become more and more apparent following the Grandfell disaster and indeed in the subsequent four years. It's simply deeply unfair that people who bought properties in good faith in Reading and across the country should have to pay enormous sums of money to make those properties fire safe not only dealing with cladding, but a range of other issues which I want to uh, address today in my short speech. Um, there's also the very serious issue of properties under 18 metres, and in my area many blocks are under 18 metres high, and, they, and, and I'm sure colleagues across the House will have the same issues in their constituencies, and the residents' owned blocks deserve to be treated much better by the government and the industry. So to give um, colleagues a small example of what this might mean, um, I would like to just describe a property, an attractive looking property, a desirable property, next to one of the rivers in Reading. An attractive block, beautifully designed with an attractive foyer, a great place to live in many ways, central to the town, but in the case of a fire, potentially a danger at rabbit, dangerous rabbit warren of small corridors which it would be difficult to escape from. This block contains a huge amount of fire safety problems and tenant and residents may have to pay £150,000 each to get these put right. And these include issues with uh, fire doors, issues with the doors into flats, issues with internal, a lack of internal partitions, so that a fire could rip through a block that contains over 100 separate flats, um, a whole range of other difficult problems. And these are not addressed by the bill, and they need to be, in my opinion. I'd also like to briefly mention the issue of the, co the confusion uh, and indeed the, the lack of information until the very last minute about the EWS1 form. Now, there, there are serious issues with getting these forms, and it's right that the government look into this. But to present it in this way in a, as a written statement on the eve of a debate surely can't be right. And I would ask the Secretary of State and his colleagues to really reflect on this. It's caused a great deal of confusion and concern today. It's perplexing. Equally, briefly, if I may, Madam Deputy Speaker, there is a model already of how to resolve this, and that's the Australian model, as indeed has been mentioned by colleagues across the House. And just finishing briefly, ultimately, this is a question of leadership from the Secretary of State. And Yerling, Bob Blackman. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. As a member of the HCLG Select Committee, I've had the opportunity of spending many hours scrutinising the draft bill as we conducted pre-legislative scrutiny. And I'm delighted that the government has adopted almost all of the recommendations that we've made. However, there are concerns, and I think one of the issues is that some of the language used within the bill is not exact enough. Clearly, what will matter will be the regulations underpinning this extremely complicated and complex bill that will need to be ironed out over the next 18 months before the bill uh, actually becomes operational. And that, of course, gives rise to the further problems. There will be no excuse whatsoever for a developer currently developing a, a new high-rise building or indeed planning uh, one in the future that they don't abide by the rules and regulations that are going to be introduced when this bill becomes law. They will have to do so. However, there is a concern about the historical elements of the, the uh, uh, fire safety defects as well as the remediation of unsafe cladding. We do have to split this up into a number of areas. Clearly, the, uh, there has been much progress on remediation of unsafe cladding, uh, which is welcome. But the fire safety defects have been excluded from almost everything that is on offer from the government thus far. 
developers are trying to wash their hands of it. As honourable and right honourable members have mentioned across the House, um, the fact is that leaseholders are being presented with huge bills right now. Uh, they don't have 18 months to wait to resolve these issues and to sort them out. So we do need urgent action. We were promised um, the details of the forced loan scheme uh, to be introduced at the time of the budget. Well, I assume, therefore, we're going to have to wait for the autumn budget as opposed to the spring budget, because so far we haven't seen the details of how that's going to operate. That's vital for people knowing what they can, how they can plan. Because the reality is that the people in the middle of this, the innocent parties, which we have to remember, are the leaseholders. The building owners, um, the people that develop the buildings in the first place, are the ones that put these buildings up. Now, there is an excuse. There is one excuse they can cling to, and that is to say that the rules and regulations which were put in place when they put the buildings up, maybe 5, 10, or even 20 years ago, they've adhered to completely. Well, if that is the case, then the government have to find a way of funding the remediation because the government was responsible for putting in place the regulations. If those regulations have been blatantly ignored, however, it's quite clear the building uh, owners and developers must remediate the buildings and the fire safety defects without any charge to the leaseholders whatsoever. So this is a, a good start to the process. I welcome the bill and I welcome the committee stage that's going to go through and we can get through to safeguard leaseholders. Dr Kieran Mullen. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Welcome to this bill will give residents and homeowners more rights and make homes across the country safer. This bill seeks to improve the whole regime of fire safety from start to finish. In my constituency, we have the terrible example of the fire at the Beechmere Retirement Complex in 2019 that destroyed the building, leaving more than 150 people without their homes and their belongings destroyed. I pay tribute to Cheshire Fire and Rescue for their work in battling the blaze and also to thank local heroes that helped residents evacuate. What happened at this building is, of course, at the front of my mind. We are still to find out the cause of the fire, and I've been meeting regularly with Cheshire Fire and Rescue Service to push them to conclude their investigation so people get answers. Whilst rightly the focus has been on external cladding and high-rise buildings, we must ensure we use this moment of fire safety reform to act on risks across the board. I want to focus on asking the government to go further and be more prescriptive with those buildings which use timber or are housing or being used by vulnerable people, irrespective of height. What I want to talk about relates to approved document B and building bulletin 100, but I'm sure the minister will understand why I'm raising these issues in the context of this bill. On the issue of timber, the Beechmere building was timber framed and what happened seemed to reflect what has happened at many other fires in similar buildings. There is a wealth of long-standing concerns about the use of timber, not just in relation to external frames. And there are particular concerns about how in a timber building, post-completion works and modifications can easily destroy fire safety measures. We must ensure this risk is properly addressed. And on the second issue, we must think more carefully about restrictions based on what a building is used for. I think it's proportionate to make specific mandated additional requirements for buildings like schools and care homes, which house people that will struggle to evacuate. For example, sprinklers. Myself and colleagues at the Fire Safety APPG have highlighted the issue that automatic fire sprinklers are compulsory in new care homes in Wales and Scotland, but this is not the case in England. This is also the case with schools. Of almost 1,000 fires over five years in buildings where sprinklers were fitted, research conducted by the National Fire Chiefs Council found they controlled or extinguished blazes in 99% of cases. Automatic fire sprinklers save lives. They also, in the case of schools, allow children back into the classroom sooner. I know the Secretary of State wants a system that's dynamic and responsive and not overly prescriptive. At this stage, when we can't yet know what a whole new regime is going to deliver in terms of better decision making on a building by building basis, I think we should be more cautious and risk averse and have an approach that mandates specific measures like sprinklers, for certain building types and additional measures for certain building materials like timber, regardless of height. Welcome the Building Safety Bill and the reforms it will make to building control and building regulations, but it's vital that the government goes further, applying additional protections to certain buildings, so we can all be confident the buildings we live, work and learn in are as safe as possible. Thank you. And by video link, Daisy Cooper. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. There are two ways to look at this bill, what's in it and what is not. I welcome the proposed building safety regulator and the move to finally establish the principle that there must be an accountable person. But there is much in this bill that is still seriously and dangerously lacking. 
The bill still uses height, not risk, as the primary criteria for when regulation kicks in. The arbitrary and discredited 18 metre cutoff must be dropped and risk factors must be taken into account, especially in schools and care homes. On public registers, at committee stage of the Fire Safety Act, I propose that the government create a register of qualified fire risk assessors. The minister at the time assured me that he was working with industry to introduce such a register, and so the amendment was withdrawn. So where is it now? Will the Secretary of State bring forward an amendment to create this register, as well as a register of, uh, safety, of safe building materials too? On the ESW1 form, I don't even know where to start on today's rushed announcement. Isaac was asking about this um, uh, for buildings last September. Some of my constituents have put their lives on hold for the best part of a year, and now it transpires that they may not even need that particular form. And finally, we were promised that the plight of leaseholders would be addressed in this bill. We were assured time and time again that the fire safety bill was not the right place because this bill was coming down the track. Leaseholders do not have the deep pockets or legal expertise to pursue giant corporations as the government is suggesting. The government just needs to stump up the cash, make homes safe, and then use its power to make polluters pay. It's actually really simple. It's been done in Australia. It's an off the shelf solution that has been shown to work. So surely, surely the government realises that it must now bring forward protections for the tens of thousands of leaseholders who were promised by the Prime Minister that they would not be made to pay for fire safety defects not of their, make, or not of their making. Because if he doesn't, members of this house will fight tooth and nail working across the house to deliver justice for building safety victims. By video link, Mark Lurgan. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, the telly has been showing horrific scenes of flooding across the globe recently. Uh, what is infuriating is the, the more overtly man-made mini-flooding that my constituents in Holden Mill and Astley Bridge have been exposed to. Um, water ingress, where once penthouses have become unwanted pools, decompartmentalisation leading to fire risk and issues around cladding, all of which are liable to increase costs for the tormented people living there. With today's bill, this government, this Secretary of State and hopefully this MP have the chance to put things right for the people of Holden Mill. These proposed reforms are welcome, uh, particularly the extensions of the 1972 Act and the limitation period. However, Clause 124 is unlikely to be in place for at least a year, and leaseholders risk having to pay ruinous costs for months to come. The only real route of redress against culpable parties is usually through costly litigation. So will the Department outline provisions in place to help cash-strapped leaseholders and management companies pay for legal action involving extensions to the limitation period. 20%, can you believe it, 20% of residents in Cotton Works, uh, which is a mill converted into a uh, dwelling in my constituency, are affected by water ingress due to poor conversion by the developer PJ Livesey. And despite insurance cover with NHBC, my constituents are facing a potential shortfall in excess of £1 million. The circumstances these residents are living under are torrid. Leaseholders have already had to pay into a levy on top of service charges to cover temporary measures concerning PJ Livesey's alleged feelings in relation to fire compartmentation. The timing of the levy could not be any worse, and it is vital that these future costs are not passed on to innocent leaseholders. So further, how do we ensure that responsible or culpable parties don't abuse the statute of limitations by simply running down the clock? The 100, or 280 actually leaseholders at the Cotton Works could face further levies and they fear not being in the position to fund legal action. These companies, and I'm sure there's many cases of this right across the country, um, fear not being into, um, sorry, have, have sloppy shoulders regarding poor workmanship at the site, ping-ponging my constituents from company to company. So I'll be voting with the government, standing shoulder to shoulder with these residents in Astley Bridge and across the country. And just finally, yes, the intention to create a system of duty holders throughout the design, construction and occupation of high-risk buildings in the bill is welcome. 
but can the Minister and the Department assure my constituents that this will be applied retrospectively, providing residents with the power to finally make I'm someone... By, I'm by video link. Rishinara Ali. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I want to begin by paying my respects to all those who lost their lives in the Grenfell Tower disaster and all those who, their family members, their relatives, who've continued to campaign to protect others in our country. And I also want to pay tribute to all those in my own constituency who've been campaigning, uh, given the large number of uh, blocks with ACM cladding and other safety risks. While I, while I support many aspects of this bill, it's very clear that the government is missing an opportunity to protect the hundreds of thousands of people who need protection. And that's why it's really important that while the Building Safety Fund is welcome, the government looks to provide additional funding for, for those blocks that are not getting the funding that they urgently need. And while freeholders should, uh, the companies that are responsible should pay it shouldn't be on, as I've argued time and again over the last four years, it shouldn't be on our residents to have to go after them. The government should be going after them uh, and it hasn't done enough and needs to do much more. Madam Deputy Speaker, when the Grenfell uh, Tower disaster happened, the then Prime Minister said that we should do whatever it takes. We will do whatever it takes to protect our people. And yet, year in, year out, many of us across different parties, including on the governing party, have campaigned and we're still arguing about funding and support for our constituents. And despite what the um, Secretary of State has said today, the Fire Brigade Union has spoken about the fact that build the Building Safety Fund completely ignores unsafe buildings beneath the arbitrary 18 uh, metre limit. And as the Secretary of State admitted himself, um, there are still people who uh, are at risk. Um, he mentioned 10 people who died. Uh, 10 is too many. Uh, and it's important that this government doesn't create this trend of a callous disregard for human life. Uh, that is what our constituents feel who live in fear, uh, who've had to live in fear over lockdown in dangerous ACM cladded properties. And in Poplar and Limehouse, we saw a fire uh, in Tower Hamlets in May this year, and it was described, and this is a block with ACM cladding, it was described by the Sunday Times as being minutes away from another Grenfell Tower disaster. And in our borough, there are 291 buildings which remain at risk. And that is why we need the government to take action and to improve this bill, accept the Labour amendments and other sensible amendments that are being proposed to improve, the, improve this bill. And Madam Deputy Speaker, in blocks like Claremont Court, where Tower Hamlets Community Housing, one of the housing associations, a number of others who've applied for the Building Safety Fund, while we've received some funding, others have been rejected for no good reason. Uh, and I hope that the Secretary of State will look at those cases again. Thank you.